1989, a year where we get a pretty goofy superhero turned into one of the deepest, darkest superheroes we've ever seen. In video games, we get a game that is so good, I deemed it worthy of tattooing on my body. And in music, we get some of the most heavy pounding rock anthems of all time. Let's take a look at 1989. Every year we make it through, more and more memories are locked into place in our minds. Certain video games or movies or even a simple chorus from a song you knew and loved can mean so much. Let's take a moment and talk about what makes each year from our past so special. On today's episode, the year is... Let's start off with an amazing movie directed by Tim Burton, and that's Batman. This Batman was so important to the world of Batman going forward. And the reason I say that is this changed up everything we knew about Batman. Batman earlier, previous to this, was a lot more goofy, a lot more silly, a lot more dancing, a lot of zoom, a lot of zazz, a lot of pow, a lot of kapow. And yes, there was some graphic novels as well, but this direction Batman took really showed us the Batman that I personally grew to love, the dark the dreary and the heavy atmospheric Batman. Here we have Michael Keaton playing Batman, and take note that this Batman isn't as ninja-like or martial arts-like as newer Batmans, let's say like Christian Bale. He's a little bit more sturdy, a little bit more just a character inside of a costume. But nonetheless, he did a great job, and I love the way Michael Keaton portrayed Batman. But there's absolutely no way I can skip over Jack Nicholson as the Joker. I personally like many other other people struggle to see who I like best fit as the Joker. And interestingly enough, maybe a few years ago I would have said, well, it's between Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger. But now Jack Nicholson, Heath Ledger, and Joaquin Phoenix. Honestly, I think all three of them did an absolutely stellar job portraying the Joker. All in all, I'm really thankful for this movie because this movie gave me a love for superheroes. Now let me make this clear, I am not a big superhero fan. Going forward, when we do more of these years, you won't really hear me talking about superheroes because I don't really like superhero movies and that's just a personal opinion but when it comes to Batman thanks to this movie and this dark approach that was taken to Batman I now have a superhero that I love to watch Hold on. the first movie I remember seeing multiple times in the theater was Bill and Ted's excellent adventure Bill and Ted's excellent excellent adventure. The movie's about two slackers who have to pass their history exam in high school in order to not only pass the class, but graduate from high school. Bill S. Preston, Esquire, and Ted Theodore Logan are tasked with finding all of these characters from world history to bring on stage and blow away the minds of their fellow classmates. The movie is hilarious. The setup is great. Taking historical figures and bringing them to the modern day and seeing what would happen. It also sets up one of the best scenes in the whole movie, which is they go to the local mall and chaos ensues. Also, my favorite part of the movie is when Ted is trying to tell Missy the names of all of the different characters, and he keeps on having to try and cover for them by calling them like John Socrates or Bob Beethoven, etc. Hilarious movie. Totally great, and this year in 2020, they're making a threequel of it. Definitely one to check out, and a super memorable movie from 1989. Socrates Johnson, De Dennis Froon, and uh, uh. This movie was nothing but a delight to watch as a young child, and that's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Are you trying to tell me the machine works? Do the kids know? Well, yeah, the kids know. In Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, you have the amazing Rick Moranis playing a father who is obsessed with gadgets and gizmos and creating different types of creations. As you would expect in any movie like this, what do you know? An experiment goes wrong, things go wrong, and guess what? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. 
The kids are now shrunken and this really lets the director play around with a ton of different things in this movie because if you imagine yourself as a tiny, tiny, tiny person, everything then is extremely huge. Every simple thing is now larger than life. It's crazy to think about it. If you look on the floor and even see a dust particle or an ant or an acorn or a nut or whatever it is, but you imagine yourself as much smaller than that and it's crazy to think, wow, this now is given a whole new life. Even an inanimate object. Even myself going forward in the future, I've caught myself thinking about that. Even recently, catching crabs with my daughter, and I said out loud, can you imagine being that small and having someone like us so much bigger looking down on you, even if you don't mean any harm, but how frightening that can be. So again, it was just amazing to see all the different scenarios take place. One of my favorites being the Cheerios scene. I don't know why, that's just one that really stuck with me as an adult. All in all, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is a fantastic adventure and a wild ride to watch, and in my opinion, probably inspired the new game Grounded, which I've been playing, by the way. A lot of people refer to this as, hey, it's pretty much Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the video game. Did you report some missing children? Oh, there must be some mistake. Ours are in the backyard. Right, Honey? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. The first rated R movie I saw in theaters was 1989's Civil War epic, Glory, starring Matthew Broderick as Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, the leader of the Massachusetts 54th Infantry, an infantry made up of black men who are going to fight in the Civil War. This movie is incredible. It's deeply, deeply moving, and by historical standards is reasonably accurate, especially for a movie. Notably, the acting across the board is amazing. Denzel Washington earning his Oscar, Morgan Freeman, Matthew Broderick way against type as Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, and very convincing if I might add, and Andre Brower, aka Captain Raymond Holt from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, major parts of this cast. One of the things also about this movie that's incredible is its soundtrack, and it culminates into this amazing final climactic scene in the assault on Fort Wagner, and it's perfectly orchestrated. The cinematography, the direction, the scope, it all comes together in one of the most incredibly gut-wrenching, leaves you in tears cinema moments. Definitely check out the movie Glory if you're looking for a great, great film. Every holiday season, a ton of families have a holiday tradition of watching a Christmas movie together as a family. And I'd say there's a few movies that stick out as some of the most watched ones, but one of them has to be, for sure. That's Christmas Vacation. Merry Christmas! If Santa is smart, he'll stay well clear of this joint. It's a death trap. I absolutely love Clark Griswold in this movie. It is such a popular name in the world and the culture of Christmas movies. I'd say it's right up there tied head to head with Kevin McAllister. Clark Griswold encompasses everything that a lot of people feel during Christmas time. You know, as a father especially, a lot of times we set out with these great aspirations and these great ideas of what you want Christmas to be. And as any good dad will tell you, well, things don't always go as planned. And with that, as a dad, you see Clark Griswold do what all of us try to do. We try to keep the family going. We try to keep the family happy. Even when things are falling apart and the family's going crazy and you have the staple crazy grandparents and crazy uncles and crazy siblings. Yes, there is all that madness, but Clark is trying so hard to keep the family together even when his work life isn't going well. Yes, he snaps because that's what all of us do as regular humans once in a while. We kind of lose control and lose focus, but in the end you see Clark do nothing but time and time again try to keep his family happy and to keep them smiling. I myself have always been obsessed with Christmas, even when it comes to decorating the house, the inside of the house, the holiday spirit. I'm obsessed with Christmas songs, and it's funny because I've had people think they're mocking me by telling me, what are you, Clark Griswold? Look at the way you're decorating your house. I sit back and in my head, I'm like, thanks for the compliment. That thing had nine lives. She just spent them all. <laughs> you woo, crack up. River City Ransom is not just a good game, it's a great game. In fact, it's such a good game that I got it tattooed on my arm.
You see, as a kid, I played beat em up games all the time, and I love beat em up games, but I never was super into RPG games, and I've said that before on the show, and I've never really accredited River City Ransom to any of this, but I think maybe it was footsteps to a little bit more RPG style without making me play a full on turn based RPG game. And what I mean by that is it took everything we loved in a beat em up game, but it gave us just a little bit more. Not too much to make me be bored as a young kid because I didn't have the patience for any RPG style games, but River City Ransom gave me what I loved and it just added a little. It added some stops to get health, to get stamina, to get different weapons, even to read books, but no, you don't have to sit there and read the book. You read a book and then you acquire certain moves, Dragon Feet, Stone Hands, Acro Circus, all these great power-ups that really enhance the gameplay experience as a beat-em-up, but makes you want to play it even longer. And it's interesting because I've played so many beat-em-up games after this that have a really simple skill set when it comes to moves or weapons, but River City Ransom, looking back all the way to 1989, had so many moves you could acquire, so many different moves you could work off with your teammate, so many different games you could play with the weapons, and so on. So River City Ransom was definitely ahead of its time, and nothing but a good game and a good experience to this day. In 1989, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were all the rage for a kid like me. Fresh from the sewer, and into your Nintendo Entertainment System comes Ultra's version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now you can take control of these heroes in a half shell as they nunchuck, swim, and bazooka blast their way through sewers and streets, ridding the world of rival robots, wretched ruffians, and the evil Foot Clan forever. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they're out of the sewers and available where Ultra Games are sold. And when Ultra Games, aka Konami, released the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Nintendo Entertainment System video game, I was thrilled because I thought that I would be playing the TMNT arcade game. I brought the game home, started playing it, and quickly became frustrated as this game is infamously difficult. The water level is everything that caused kids like me to throw their controllers across the living room. In spite of its cool graphics, the overworld style in which parts of the game played out, and then the platforming segments that that would follow it. This was a great game in some ways and a deeply disappointing and frustrating game in others. Regardless, it was incredibly memorable. And later, when the TMNT arcade game was ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System, it solved all my problems. Being a kid, everything that was bigger always seemed better. Which in return is why I always loved big sprites on a video game. And one game that stuck out to me quite a bit when it came to big sprites, that was Bonk's Adventure. Now whether Bonk's Adventure did have really big sprites or not, either way it played a trick on your eye because Bonk's body was little, or maybe it was even average size. But in regard to his head, Bonks looked huge. And I loved that video game and it really stuck out because you were then using your head as a weapon. That was something I had not really seen in a video game before. If anything, in previous video games, getting hit in the head was a bad thing. But Bonk seemed to use his head for everything. Two of my favorite things in the video game is how you would find random pieces of meat and you would eat that meat and then Bonks would either turn into a mutant or have some crazy power up or be invincible. But either way, Bonks just seemed so awesome after he ate his meat. Maybe some adults it was some of their hidden messages as ways to get kids to eat more protein? I'm not really sure. And another thing that I've always said time and time again in video games is I'm always going to pick a character that can float if I have the option because in video games when I can float I can maneuver better, I can think a little bit longer just like Princess Peach in Mario Bros 2. So with bonks when you jump in the air you can repeatedly hit the button and then you can spiral your way down into a better floating mechanism. I love bonks and I think it's definitely a game that deserves a lot more praise. There's a lot of big staples in there when it comes to big characters and important characters in video games, Bonks needs to be talked about more. <laughs> 
You would think that every time Nintendo releases a brand new console, everyone wants to play the Mario game. And as cool as the Mario game was on the Nintendo Game Boy, which came out for the first time in 1989, it was the game Tetris that blew my mind the most. Quick, short spurts of play made this game incredibly addictive, especially while driving in the backseat to whatever destination we were going on. Road trips to grandma's house or wherever, Tetris was with me everywhere. I know people could say that Tetris was out first on the Nintendo Entertainment System prior. However, the Game Boy version is the one that I think catapulted it into something else entirely. In fact, today when people resell Game Boys, most of the time there's a copy of Tetris not far away from that Game Boy console. Definitely a classic. This next game, if I'm being honest, I never thought it was extremely great, and I never thought it was bad by any means, but I always thought DuckTales on the NES had everything perfectly placed into that perfect medium of a really good video game. We invited an expert team to our laboratory to give us their opinions of Disney's DuckTales video game from Capcom. Yes! Awesome! You'll have exciting adventures helping Scrooge McDuck escape danger and become the richest duck in the world. Cool. Totally hot. Way radical, man. Excellent. It's a quacker. Oh! Disney's DuckTales game for your Nintendo Entertainment System by Capcom. And what I mean by that is we didn't have too many mechanics in the game and we didn't have too little mechanics in the game. What we had worked and what's important is everything worked perfectly. All of your moves worked exactly the way that you wanted them to. Every jump, every hit, every pogo, anything you did, if you did it right, it would work perfectly. And that's what's really important in a video game. And of course it's always a plus when you're playing a video game that works perfectly, but you then have characters that you love inserted into said video game. And I know everybody wants to talk about the moon theme, but personally, yes, I do like that song, but I believe there are so many better songs in that video game. That soundtrack is a track that I would always use when editing videos for our old show, Retro Liberty. I would always type in DuckTales OST, original soundtrack, take a lot of the songs, and put them underneath us talking during pickup videos, and it wasn't usually the moon theme. It was many others. Well, especially the Amazon. This song is just one of those songs that just when it kicks in, you know what it is and you gotta pump your fist and sing it. And that's Paradise City by Guns N' Roses. I used to love this song to death. This was one of those songs, as I said, to where when it comes on, you're in. I just slapped my new tattoo and that genuinely hurt. Paradise City is one of those songs, and this is gonna sound weird, that's a song but almost doesn't seem like a song anymore. And what I mean by that is it's become such an anthem that it's almost just that at this point. And I can see that really for any songs almost like We Will Rock You or anything that's a big anthem at like a baseball stadium or a soccer stadium or anything like that. These songs kind of lose their songiness, if that makes sense, and they just become something else, almost just like a pump up song in a way. And with that, it's kind of bittersweet because I can kind of honestly say that I don't really like the song as much as I used to. Yes, I still enjoy the song for what it is, but it's not something I necessarily turn on to listen to anymore. I'll just listen to it if it happens to come on. Oh, and this is an absolutely hilarious fact about this song. Slash wanted the chorus to be, take me down to the paradise city where the girls are fat and they got big. I'm not going to say what he wanted it to say, but you get the picture. Either way, it is a great song. In the 1980s, glam rock, hair metal, this was all the rage. Bands like Skid Row with the song 18 in Life, or Poison with Every Rose Has Its Thorn. But perhaps no band was at the top of their game more so than Motley Crue with the album Dr. Feel Good. And the namesake of that album, Dr. Feel Good, that song, I don't care who you are, it's still an incredibly well-written song that emphasizes everything about Motley Crue. All of the sleaze, all of the rollicking sort of song structure, all of of it is just an incredible song. Though Motley Crue's reputation may overshadow so many other parts of the band, as a song, 
Dr. Feelgood is great. The thumping drums and the bass line. As soon as you hear that intro, it grabs you. And even by today's standards, when people are playing in drop C or drop D or whatever, that song is still super heavy. And I have to say, Mick Mars guitar playing on that song, especially the solo that's around the breakdown section, he's not only playing like virtu with virtuosity and with lots of technicality, but there's an atmosphere to that guitar solo and to the way the song is structured. Lyrical content aside, this is an incredibly well-made, well-written 80s anthem, and it could only have been done the way it was in 1989. Paula Abdul has had a lot of things happen in her career during her life, but I have to say a highlight for me is the song Straight Up. Probably one of the most defining 80s sounding songs for me. Again, I've talked about my sister many times. When I think of my sister, there's a number of songs that come on, just the beats and the style and even vocals. They kind of really make me reminisce about my sister. This is definitely another one of those. And I know, again, like I said earlier, Paula Abdul's career has kind of been all over the place. A big staple for her was being on American Idol, and she was always a little different, a little weird, a little loopy. Kind of made a lot of people question was it actually in her drink, but that's okay. I'm not here to judge on that. What's really interesting, I find, is that I have kind of locked her into a certain place in my mind, and I locked her into this time frame of straight up. And I think sometimes that's really cool because people in life have ups and downs and highs and lows, and hopefully we can always remember some people, at least when it's justifiably so, remember them in a good light. And for me, it's straight up. Nineteen eighty nine was definitely a great year for independent and punk rock and hardcore music. Gorilla Biscuits with the album Start Today, or Operation Ivy with the album Energy. But the band that means the most to me is Fugazi, coming onto the scene with the full length 13 songs. And of those 13 songs, the song Waiting Room is an all time post hardcore classic. And Fugazi is interesting. They're not punk rock in the sense of where you kind of think of that as punk rock. And they're not hardcore with the ultra heavy chugga chuggas or anything. They're somewhere between all of that. They have the energy and vibe of punk rock and, and the energy of hardcore, but it's not either one of those things. Even today, the song is trans transcended its genre. Even school of rock kind of schools today where kids learn how to play rock music, so many of them play the song Waiting Room. It's a great song with Guy Picciotto and Ian Mackay playing off of one another vocally and the way that the song structure is that beat, everything about it is everything. In fact, if you search online, there's an incredible video of them playing in what looks like an underground warehouse or a basement or something of like 200 or 300 kids packed into this room and just sweaty and chaotic and crazy, but it's super controlled. It's not ultra violent. It's just everything you hope for in independent music. And Fugazi emphasized that in everything that they did, their ethic as a band and the way they wrote songs and how influential they've been on most bands that have come after them. Definitely a song worth checking out. And even in their entire catalog, it's one you can't miss. Being obsessed with my romantic love songs, I got Right Here Waiting by Richard Marks. There are so many love songs that just really pull at the strings, like this guy is singing because he means it. Now this song, I Will Be Right Here Waiting For You, is extremely pulley. You can feel it. There is a sense in this song that he means what he's saying. And what I mean by that is there are many songs in the world to where when they come out, you're like, yeah, you feel like somebody else wrote this or somebody else produced this and is just having a head figure sing it for them. No, this song feels a certain way, so I looked into it to see and I found why. In a 2010 interview, Richard Marks told this to an Indian newspaper. I wrote this song for my wife Cynthia who was in South Africa shooting for a film. We were not married then and I wanted to meet her because I had not seen her for a few months, but my visa application was rejected and when I came back, I wrote the song which was more of a letter from me to her. So he was definitely yearning for love right there and another interesting fact, he went on to say later on, this song only took him about 20 minutes to write. That's talent.
All right, everybody, that was my look at 1989. Let me know what you liked best about this year. Was it the movies, was it the music, or was it the video games? Up next, we're diving in. We're diving head into the 90s with 1990. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one, and really, thank you for watching.